Hello and welcome to tonight's StoryWorks Roundtable. We are talking about point of view, which is um, topical and exciting because I am working on the StoryWorks Guide to Writing Point of View right now. It will be coming out soon this spring. So we thought, what a great time to discuss hey. point of view, right? Bring exactly. it on. Yeah. So the first thing I want to say about point of view is that when we talk about point of view, just generally, writers are usually only talking about the point of view character. Who's your point of view? What point of view is the story from? And you're thinking first person or third person generally, right? But point of view is so much bigger than that. Your point of view character is just one aspect of point of view. So your point of view, simply put, is the narrative construct through which a reader experiences a story. So that's your narrator, your narrative voice, whether you... <laughs> I'm going to like launch into this lesson here, but basically... <laughs> <laughs> Just I'm learning, a, I'm learning. Great. At a very basic level, before we start breaking it into different parts, um, you've got an author who creates a narrator and a point of view character, and they are like your left and right hands. And, you know, yeah, you can function with only one of them, but we're meant to have both. And life is so much better when you do have both. <laughs> so... Don't forget about your narrator. Your narrator, in fact, enters the point of view character's head. So everything the reader experiences except for dialogue and action is through the narrator. Right? Yes. So you've got to um, really shift the way you think about point of view and stop thinking of it only as a character and focus on the narrator as being bigger than the character, and in some ways more essential than a character. We tell stories all the time without point of view characters. They're called anecdotes. You know, <laughs> this mm. happened, and then this happened, mm. and the sun looked like that, and the car looked like that, and blah, 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 right? So there you go. Narrative construct of which the character is just a central part. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to stop there and and open up the round table. <laughs> yeah, that, that's good. That's that made me really think though, because you know the whole idea that you're you can have an unreliable narrator, and by separating it out like that, you, you say well the author could also be the unreliable narrator, the the, the omniscient um, point of view, or omniscient narration, but then you could to, to come into a close third, or you know, it's lots of different ways to drive the story forward using narration techniques. Right. Well, and the narrator is primarily narrators are reliable. So an unreliable narrator yeah. is a very yeah. specific yeah. type of narrator, but you can have an authorial voice. You can have an authorial persona, or you can have a character as narrator. Those are your three basic mm. types. So, an omniscient narrator is an authorial voice that is impersonal. It's the author yeah. as God, speaking from on high, removed from the characters, omniscient and omnipresent, right? You can also have an author who's got a very friendly voice with a lot of um, character or charisma, uh, a lot of sort of friendly, chummy appeal, but it's still a third person that is not a part of the story. It's not a character yep. as narrator. Yep. It's an authorial yep. persona. So you're putting yep. a mask on and injecting this personality between yourself and the reader. And then yep. you've got your first person narrator, occasionally a second person or um, first person plural, like in 
uh, the virgin suicides, right? Yeah. Jeffrey Eugenides. So then with the author as, with the narrator as character, the character is a player in the story instead of an observer. So omniscient or not, <laughs> those are your kind of your three basic types of narrative. And is, in your, go on. I was going to say, this is something I've been struggling with a lot. And Alita knows this. I keep asking questions about it because I keep being like, okay, well, hold on. So I've been listening for it. Um, I listen to audiobooks more than I read lately, um, just in general. And it's interesting to hear when you start listening for it or reading for it um, to find those differences between the narrator character and realizing how much of an effect it has on how mm -hmm. you view the story is really fascinating. I'm reading a story right now um, that the narrator, it's a first person narrative, but the narrator is significantly older, same character, but significantly older mm -hmm. than he was at the time. And and just the, the interjections and the way that he talks about his younger self and, and the story and how it unfolds. And I didn't know it at the time and things like that. Like, mm -hmm. I honestly, like eight months ago, nine months ago, wouldn't have even thought about it. I would have just been like, da, 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 point of view character. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but it is, it, it makes a huge difference in the tone of the book and the feel of the book and the way that I'm viewing the, the mm -hmm. character. I, you know, I know that he's grown up. Like, I know. Um, the way that he felt at the time versus the way that he feels now. And like that, oh, that changes the experience of the book, which is fascinating to me. Right, right. It really does. And that brings up such a great point that even when you've got a first person narrator, unless it's a first person present tense, you've got two people. You've got the character mm -hmm. as character and the character as narrator. So mm -hmm. the narrator is in a different space and time than the character who's doing and being on the page in that moment. And that grants the narrator a broader perspective and hindsight and, you know, greater wisdom and such that can shed light on what the character is doing. Mm -hmm. So even though it's the same person, it's a first person narrator, it's a different person, really. It's mm -hmm. just like we're different people now than we were 10 or 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> and our stories bear that out. So that's something to consider, isn't it? If you are writing first person, mm -hmm. past tense, mm -hmm. how far in the future is the narrator compared to the character in the story? Yes. So yeah, are they writing it from 10 minutes in the future or what? Or mm -hmm. 10 minutes past? Right. Did, did it just happen or was it five years ago? Um, that's right. interesting. Right. It is. And it's a really fun thing to work with in your story. I've got a book that is a literary historical fiction that I've been working on recently. And the narrator is telling the story from, you know, half an hour after the climax of the book, it's right after the end of the book. But the timeline of the story is 12 years. So the story mm -hmm. starts when she's almost six years old. And it ends when she's 18 years old. So yeah. you really see the difference in maturity and perspective and knowledge. And that gap closes as the character ages. So the narrator is always up here telling the story, but the character goes from yeah. a little girl yeah. who jumps and skins her knee and pouts and, you know, acts like a five year old to yeah. someone who goes through all those life changes. And we see that gap close between the character and the narrator. And also, besides the maturity and the hindsight and all that kind of intellectual narrative distance, you have to factor in your character's emotional narrative distance. So if you're looking back 12 years, you're going mm. to have had mm. so much water under your bridge that you can look at that event much more objectively. And you still need to make it emotional on the page for the character doing and the reader experiencing, but realize that the narrative is coming from a different vantage point. But if you're talking about something that happened yesterday, right, that emotional gap closes and it's still raw. It's still intense for the narrator as well as the character. Mm -hmm. So that's another thing that should come through in the voice of any piece you're writing. Mm. That's right. going to sort of help drive 
tension and intrigue as well within the story. So I can see that that choice of narrator and narrat narrative devices mm -hmm. there is a big part of how that story would evolve. Mm -hmm. Right, it is. And you need to think too, I mean, it's really voice and your narrator connects with your reader. The reader doesn't, you know, we know we connect with the point of view character because that's who's yep. living and experiencing, but the narrator's perspective shapes that connection as well. So let's say you've got a character who um, is... Uh, who succumbs to peer pressure, like he wants to fit in with a group of bad kids who are bullies. And so they make him, you know, pick on somebody, punch somebody, Good do something really rotten, rotten right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, some kind of really rotten rite of passage. And if our narrative is close, if it's a really close third, and we're experiencing all that horrible rawness, this kid might be seem like a terrible person. And we as readers go, ooh. Mm. So there's this thing called identification or opposition. So yep. if our character is doing this really horrible thing that we disapprove of, we're going to be in opposition. But if your narrator says, I did this when I was 12, and boy, growing up since then, I'm really, I've learned, I look back, I'm so ashamed. We say, mm -hmm. Oh, well, I can understand you were pressured, you regret it, you aren't really a bad person, you just had this really awful moment as a kid. And then we're closer to identification, because mm -hmm. we disapprove of the kid's action, but we understand the narrator, and maybe we've done something we aren't so proud of. Right? right? So that, that gap between the narrator, whether it's first person or third or omniscient, um, the emotional distance and perspective that narrator lends to the actions of the character affects how the reader experiences the action on the page, which is really important yes. to creating that emotional bond with the story. Mm -hmm. I like that it's because it, it, if you think about the phrase point of view, we as authors tend to, as you say, to describe how the character is main character is being portrayed in the story. Mm -hmm. But in real life, if you're having a dinner party conversation, someone might say, well, that's your point of view, um, but I think <laughs> of things differently. And so I think if you introduce that factor is what you're really saying is that somebody may have a different point of view from when they're, te when they're telling a story to when it actually happened, um, and that can be the way you write it. And equally, then, if you've got a cast of supporting characters, they're all going to have points of view. Now, you might write them all in third person, fairly distant for that particular story, but they're still going to have points of view. And their points of view are important in shaping the emotional uh, reality, the emotional realism. Of the story. Interesting. Two different definitions of points of view there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right, right. Because I'm really only talking about the literary point of view. This is point of view has a lot of overlap and a lot of room for confusion because we've got mm. the point of view as a whole, as literary terminology, the pers the point of view, the narrative distance and how that affects the story. Then the point of view character, who is the lens through which we see the story, and then if you've got multiple points of view, <laughs> it's getting even well. even hairier. But it's the narrator who controls which lens we look through when you've got multiple points of view. The narrator is in charge, you know, and often with multiple points of view, the um, author will pick the wrong character for a scene, you know, because you mm. don't. I'll read a scene and say, okay, but this character doesn't have any stakes. You really need this other person in here telling us about this piece of the action, you know? So, but the, um, the narrative, I just totally lost track of my thought there. <laughs> I'm like, wait, I'm trying to juggle too many balls and go. <laughs> I, like, I like what Robert was but, saying where the narrator yeah. has a point of view, which, which is, has an opinion basis of, of, you know, what's going on versus your character's point of view, how they're seeing it. And so your narrator can control that both point of point of views and what's being seen through the story, which is a very interesting 
dynamic that can change the way your story is being told. Right. But let's get a little bit technical before we go on here, because the the narrator can be impersonal or personal. So an, mm. um, an omniscient or a distant third person narrator is going to be impersonal. So we describe a scene and we might color it in such a way with our description that it affects how the reader views it. So like if you're watching a movie and um, two people are eating dinner without talking, they're eating dinner in silence. If the room is dark and the music is very somber, we're going to be like, oh, those people are not happy, right? But if you put on cheerful music and there's light shining through the windows, they're just eating dinner and maybe they're just kind of like don't know each other well yet or, you know, so you can use your narrative lens to create an effect, to create a mood that colors the emotional experience. But that's different from passing judgment and, and, you know, judging the action. But if you've got a close narrator, someone the authorial persona or a first person narrator, then we can pass judgment, we can give opinions on the action there, and actually, you know, make claims about the characters in the action and what's going on there. But as the author controlling the narrator, then you can shape those judgments and those reactions that the reader is going to have by using all of these subtle tools, mm -hmm. like mood and voice. You've more eloquently explained what I was trying to say, which is there's, there's so much more um, multi-layers to it than just mm -hmm. simply, okay, I'm going to write in first person. Um, well, if right. then you come across this idea that if it's in the past tense, then the person that's writing it from the future may right. have a different personal opinion about mm -hmm. The events that happened even if they only happened 10 minutes ago and that's something i never even thought i've never even considered when i'm thinking about writing mm -hmm. a story but actually could be useful because it adds to the suspension of disbelief because it's more right. real you know we all have that experience um where time changes things for example and that's just one example mm -hmm. um and then if you look at things like um it, vastly epic things like the Game of Thrones where you've got so many different points of view it's really hard to keep up with um, and they're all third person you know and mm -hmm. you can imagine if that if they were all written in first person it would be an impossible <laughs> you just couldn't read it it'd be unreadable you'd, you wouldn't be able to <laughs> it, hard to write of course but uh, so yeah. th there's some lending isn't there of of a particular point of view to certain storytelling um, sort of not I wouldn't I hesitate to say genre because I don't think it is genre specific mm -hmm. but I don't know maybe I suppose it just comes down to voice at the end of the day doesn't it well it does I mean the voice really shapes the story it's the first thing that a reader encounters with any story so you open a book and in the first sentence you're encountering point of view no matter what mm -hmm. that first sentence yeah. happens to be because you're going to get a sense of tone, voice, style, mood, before you even get into the who, what, when, where <laughs> right. of, yeah, yeah. you know, character, action, and setting. And a story that opens with very formal language is going to be different than a story that opens with a lot of slang, you know. So no matter what genre you're writing in, you want to pick a narrative voice that is suitable for that story. And that might not be your natural voice. It could be something you have to create and work at, you know, like writing historical fiction. Mm. The syntax is much more formal. And I have mm. to kind of tune my ear to that era and say, would you say it this way? Or would you say it that way? You know, take out those contractions and think about, so it's just, it's very different. But if you were writing like urban fantasy, it might be very fast, very clipped, lots of like jargon thrown in, even words you make up that are futuristic, but close enough that we can understand them. And so that's part of your narrative voice, which right. is your point of view. <laughs> yes. And whether it's the character saying it or the author, it's still the point of view. Right. 
right? The point of view of the whole, not the point yes. of view character, which. <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. This is one of those that's tools good. that you put in your toolbox and you think it's just a hammer and then you realize it's a multi tool. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and you're yeah, like, yeah, oh, yeah. now I have to learn all these other moving parts. But every time that you delve a little bit deeper into who your point of view character is, who the narrator is, how they're, you know, how they're interacting mm -hmm. with the world, whether they're this far apart, or your story is going to get better. You're, it's going to read in a better way, you know, and people are going to yeah. feel more connected because this mm -hmm. is the part, the voice and the point of view and the, you know, and the way that you're portraying the story, this is the part that readers really get excited about, you know, right. your plot and everything is exciting too, but this is the, what they cling to, like, you know, like mm -hmm. the character's voice and the narrator's way of depicting the story. So. Yeah. I love that analogy. It's like you have a Swiss army knife and you have a blade. So you spend all your time cutting things. And then one day you're like, huh? A screwdriver yeah. <laughs> and a bottle opener and a <laughs> look exactly. and a saw and a nail file. I didn't even yeah. know all this was here. Now I have to use it. Exactly. Right. Yes. <laughs> it's fun. Yeah, I, I definitely haven't given much thought to it. It's definitely been an intuitive choice. Which, oh, yeah, I'm going to turn it this way. It was, it's kind of obvious in your head, but or in my head, but a very mm -hmm. big chunk. I haven't really ever drilled down into, well, why? Um, and then I found myself writing when I first started writing fiction, multiple points of view because I was kind of used to mm -hmm. it. And then I realized that I'd mixed them up inside one scene and uh, I got mm -hmm. all head hopping. And, and it was very, when I reread it, it was very confusing. And why is this so confusing? Oh, that's right. That's because one minute I've got a character disclosing their emotions um, right. to the to the reader, um, mm -hmm. but it was a previous character, the, the paragraph before, who was um, disclosing their thoughts. I <laughs> go, whoa, that's <laughs> jarring. It is, it's, yeah, it's... yeah, and I'm glad you said that because I think a lot of us do start writing with sort of an intuitive sense of narrative where we just let it happen, but the more you learn about it, the more you can control it, and the richer and more nuanced your stories can become because yeah. you're – shaping these effects the way you desire the reader to experience them instead of it being haphazard and accidental. So. It's partly why I decided that I was going to try this first person present tense in science fiction because mm -hmm. I'd read so much third person past and it, nothing wrong with it. I enjoy it. And mm -hmm. then I then I read this Red Rising series, which was first person present tense, um, and loved it. And and just it was like it brought something fresh. Now, what is that that's fresh? And one of the things I really liked about it was the fact that there were so many things hidden, and it's really hard to write compared to third person because I or oh, I found it harder to mm -hmm. write because in third person I was able to suddenly switch to the point of view of the antagonist and therefore you know provide the you know the narrative irony that the the character main character just didn't know that was happening so you could paint the part of the villain creeping up behind mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, you know and and it was kind of, it's, <laughs> but I realized I was making it probably it, it's easy whereas it's not easy first person I don't find it easy first person present tense it's a great challenge to write it right and still keep the tension yes yes which is an awesome point and i know we have an episode just on first person okay. yeah. <laughs> so i'm so gonna we'll... let us wrap this up because we're hitting 25 we'll minutes but um yeah i just wanted to make the point that just because you can do things like go into your antagonist point of view doesn't mean you should so maybe in another episode on point of view, we'll talk about what you can do and some of the drawbacks of doing it. So uh, as you learn about point of view, one of the great things to realize is that as the author, you're in control. So you can set your rules however you want to, but then you just have to abide by them. And the beauty of this awareness of learning to use your tools and really craft your narrative is that you can spot those pitfalls and then make a different choice, you know, instead of just walking into them. Yeah, you become a taught, driven, disciplined writer who understands their craft. And That's right. <laughs> wins prizes. <laughs> yeah, that's, right. Yes. that's right. Right on. <laughs> <laughs> we should do a whole show about lazy writing. You know, what, makes you, what makes lazy writing? Things to avoid. I've got plenty of examples. Good. I can use my book. Okay. <laughs> 
Sounds good. All right. My that. early books, not today's. Today's books are fantastic. <laughs> the unpublished yeah, works, the stuff in the uh, the round the filing cabinet, as we say. Yes. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, that is it for this week's episode of the StoryWorks Roundtable. An introduction to point of view. Thank you so much for watching. And you can find all of the episodes at wordessential.com slash storyworks roundtable. And please keep an eye out for the StoryWorks Guide to Writing Point of View. It is coming soon. 